Good evening. Welcome to tonight's event, Villabrook, the last great disgrace at the College of Staten Island. My name is Nora Santiago. I'm an urban policy analyst here at CSI, and I'm also the co-chair of the Villabrook Legacy Committee. It is my honor to welcome you to this event. I'm so pleased with the turnout of 1,000 of you registered for tonight's event. This event is part of the Year of Villabrook project. Tonight, we will watch and reflect on the 50th anniversary of the ABC television expose by Geraldo Rivera, a young investigative reporter who brought the news about Villabrook into the national spotlight. He responded to the call from doctors and social workers who worked at the Villabrook State School. Gerardo's expose shocked the nation 50 years ago, and it still shocks me every day, every time I see just a glimpse of this uh, video. Before we continue with our program, there are some housekeeping details I would like to go over. Everyone will be muted during the event, except the speakers. After the viewing of the expose, Geraldo and Bernard Carabello will be here tonight to answer questions from our panelists and from the audience. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in the time we have together. Please put your questions in the Q&A tab throughout the evening to be shared with the panel later in the program. To make this event universally accessible, live captioning is being uh, captured by an actual human transcriptionist tonight and can be accessed via the CC button on the toolbar. With those details addressed, I'm pleased to able to introduce the moderator of tonight's event, Kenny Wama. Kenny Wawa is the Chancellor of Indiana University Northwest and the committed advocate for equity and inclusion. He's a former College of Staten Island Vice President for the Division of Economic Development, Continuing Studies and Government Relations. While at CSI, he facilitated implementation of the Villabrook Mile and laid the groundwork for the Villabrook Legacy Committee. He was also my former boss. At the College of Staten Island can help change the way the college viewed its connection to Willowbrook State School. Where prior administrations had often tried to hide the history of the site of our campus under the leadership of Ken and former, vice, former college president, uh, William Fritz, the college leadership finally embraced the legacy and the responsibility for advocacy on behalf of the IDD community that came with it. When the Villabrook Legacy Committee organized this event, we knew that Ken was the right person to moderate it. And we are grateful that he's able to be here with us tonight. Welcome back, Kenny Wama, to the College of Staten Island. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, so good evening and, and welcome everyone. It is probably the greatest of understatements to say that I'm honored to be here with you tonight to participate in this extraordinarily important program, Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace, Reflections on the 50th Anniversary of, of ABC's Television Expose by Geraldo Rivera. And yes, for those who may be wondering, Geraldo Rivera is here tonight in person, or rather in Zoom, to be more accurate. As uh, Nora Santiago mentioned, prior to my serving uh, in my current position in, in Indiana, I worked at the College of Staten Island for over a decade. Uh, before I became an Indiana Hoosier and IU Northwest Red Hawk, I'm proud to say I was indeed a CSI Dolphin. The College of Staten Island is situated on historic ground. CSI's idyllic, verdant, park-like campus belies its tragic past as the former home of the Wilbur State School, which gained worldwide notoriety for its inhumane treatment of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. While individual faculty and staff members have always sought to preserve the memory of the state school through such ways as the annual Willowbrook Lecture Series, there was indeed a time in our past when the college, on an institutional level, distanced itself from the perceived stigma and shame associated with this painful history of Willowbrook. I consider myself blessed to have been at CSI when it finally began to encourage, engage with its legacy of place, providing us with the invaluable opportunity to embrace our place-based connection to the Wilbrook State School and to formally acknowledge the injustice perpetrated upon thousands of res residents entrusted to its care. And tonight's event is a perfect example of CSI's continued engagement with that legacy. 
There are some in attendance tonight who may not be aware of the context of this expose. So allow me to provide a very brief background. From its very beginnings, post-World War II, the Wilbrick State School grew in resident population, but always under the conditions of overcrowding, understaffing, and underfunding by the state. The terrible consequences of institutionalization faded both in and out of the public eye for the next three decades. And then on January 6, 1972, Geraldo Rivera and his news camera crew, with the help of a Willowbrook whistleblower, Dr. Michael Wilkins, entered the Willowbrook grounds unannounced. They would break into Building 6, filming the horrific conditions in that facility, which were then broadcast that evening on ABC Eyewitness News. To quote David Good, Daryl Hill, Gene Rice, and William Bronston in their seminal book, A History in Sociology, of the Willowbrook State School. From a standpoint of the history of disability in the United States, this broadcast was an event that brought a sea change in the treatment of people with intellectual disabilities. The broadcast would grow into the national ABC broadcast expose that we now present to you, Willowbrook, the last great disgrace. Robert Kennedy walked out of one of the wards here at Willowbrook and told newsmen of the horror he'd seen inside. He pleaded then for an overhaul of a system that allowed retarded children to live in a snake pit. But that was way back in 1965 and somehow we'd all forgotten. I first heard of this big place with the pretty sounding name because of a call I received from a member of the Willowbrook staff, a Dr. Michael Wilkins. The doctor told me he'd just been fired because he'd been urging parents with children in one of the buildings, building number six, to organize so they could more effectively demand improved conditions for their children. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 severely and profoundly retarded children. And children lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces, they were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. This is what it looked like, this is what it sounded like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. We've just seen something that's probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Is that typical of ward life? Uh, yes, there are 5,300 patients at Willowbrook, which is the largest institution for the mentally retarded in the world. Uh, the ones that we saw were the most uh, severely and profoundly retarded. There are thousands there like that, uh, not going to school, sitting on the ward all day, not being talked to by anyone, only one or two or three people to take care of 70 people on the ward, sharing the same toilet, contracting the same diseases together. 100% uh, of patients at Willowbrook uh, contract hepatitis within six uh, months of being in the institution. Most patients at some time in their life have uh, parasites, the incidence of uh, pneumonias and 
uh, is greater than any uh, other group of people that I think exist in this country. Uh, trauma is severe because these patients are left together on a ward, 70 retarded people uh, basically unattended, uh, fighting for a small scrap of paper on the floor to play with, uh, fighting for the attention of the attendants who are overworked, trying to clean them, uh, feed them, clothe them, and if possible, pay a little attention to them and work with them and develop their intelligence. But what in fact happens is that they go downhill. Two days after our first unofficial visit, a camera crew was given an authorized tour of the facility. While unannounced, we'd found the children naked and basically unattended. They were shown kids who were fully clothed and generously attended. It was to ensure that this sudden improvement in the quality of life was permanent that we returned without the knowledge of the school administration and through a back door. It was the first day all over again. For these people, life is just one hour after another of, kind of looking at the floor. There's no training on here. Can the children be trained? Yes, every child can be trained. You know, these kids, there's no effort. We don't know what these kids are capable of doing. Uh, some training programs go on at Willowbrook, but the state provides a bare minimum, just enough so that they can call this place a school. The state, uh, clearly these kids aren't getting any training. I mean, I don't think I have to even have to say that. They're just sitting here on the ward. Th these are the hours during which they should be in school, and they're not. What ward is this now? This is uh, building 27. These patients do have clothes on today, but as you can see, the one thing that can't be hidden is that there are no training programs, that all these patients do is sit during the day. Uh, they're not kept uh, occupied. Uh, their life is just uh, hours and hours of endless nothing to do, no one to talk to, no expectations, just a, a, an endless life of misery and, and filth. What you see it, uh, makes you think that it's hopeless that they can't be trained, but you know, they, they only look this way because they haven't have ever had opportunity for training. They, uh, you know, if you or I were left to sit on a ward uh, surrounded by other mentally retarded people, we would probably begin looking like this too. The Willowbrook State School is this country's largest home for the mentally retarded. It's called a school, but that's more a statement of aspiration than of fact. Fewer than 20% of the 5,230 people who are kept here attend any kind of classes. When the state of New York entered a period of economic retrenchment two years ago, a hiring freeze was clamped on this and other institutions in the Department of Mental Hygiene. In the intervening months, Willowbrook lost 600 employees through attrition. For the budget for fiscal 71-72, the governor recommended a hold-the-line appropriation of $630 million for the Mental Hygiene Department. The legislature, seeking to trim the waste and fat from the budget, cut it down to about $600 million. Then the governor decided that even $600 million was too much and cut it even further, all the way down to $580 million. Willowbrook lost another 200 employees, and a situation that two years ago was bad became hopeless. The attendants tried to care for their wards, but were simply overwhelmed. The attendant-to-patient ratio, which should be about 4 to 1, dropped to 30 to 40 to 1 and the average feeding time per patient, which should be 20 or 30 minutes, went down to two and three minutes. Many of the profoundly retarded children aren't capable of, of feeding themselves. In my building, we had no staff to train them in a systematic way to use utensils to feed themselves. That can be done, but uh, what's necessary is to feed them. Uh, you take a bowl of, of uh, food that you've made into a mush-like substance with a big spoon and you ladle it out into their mouth in the buildings where the kids can't feed themselves. Uh, there are so few attendants that there's only an average of 10 times, three minutes per child for feeding. How much time would be needed to do a job adequately? The same amount of time that your children and my children would want to have to eat breakfast. What's the consequence of three minutes per meal per child? The consequence is death from pneumonia. North of the city, on the way to Bear Mountain, is a lovely looking place called the Letchworth Village Rehabilitation Center. Set among the hills and woods of suburban Rockland County, a passerby could easily mistake the place for a country club or a college campus. But the early morning mist gave the place an eerie feeling, like a set from a horror movie. And once inside, that feeling became suddenly appropriate. 
Congressman Mario Biaggi had planned an official tour of the facility for 10 o'clock in the morning, but by this time, wary of what I felt were attempts on the part of the Department of Mental Hygiene to make the situation look better than it really was, my camera crew and I got there two hours before that. As the hour of the official tour approached, bundles of clothing were brought in for the children and the process of cleaning up was begun. Even so, none of these cosmetic changes could do much to improve the place. Who's in charge here, Gary? This is Mrs. Nixon. I'm Congressman Giorgio. How are you? Why are these, why are these uh, patients unclothed? We don't have enough clothing. We don't have the proper help to keep clothing on them. We have a few nudists that will not keep clothes on. They will pull them off. But most of all, we don't have the help to keep the kids properly dressed. We're talking about more money for the, for the institution. Well, that we could use because then we will have more help. Uh, how, long, how understaffed are you? Very understaffed. There are days we have four or five attendants to take care of a hundred condition in a very beautiful ground, very well built building. Uh, inside we have housed uh, the children of many of our citizens who are subjected to the what appears to be the worst possible conditions I've ever seen in my life. I've visited penal institutions all over the country. I've visited hospitals all over the country. I've visited the, the worst brigs in the, in the uh, in the military, nothing like it. I've, I've never seen anything like it. About 25% of the funding for Letchworth Village comes from the federal government, and one of the requirements for continued eligibility is that there be 80 square feet of space per patient. Here they get only 35 square feet. In the face of this terrible overcrowding, there was a ward there that stood empty because they hadn't the funds to hire the 38 people it would take to staff it. How can this be? I think we we'll will need 38 additional positions and we will be able to staff this area and reduce our overcrowding in these overcrowded areas. That's a sin, my God, a sin. Well, we have submitted and we're expecting that we might be getting them and then we'll be able to reduce the overcrowding in certain areas. There's at least one more horrifying aspect of life at Letchworth. More than 300 able-bodied patients, both physically and mentally able to work outside the institution, are not being allowed to. They're being used to fill the places of the too few employees. They get paid $2 a week for their efforts, about what they'd make each hour on the outside. And there was another development on the day we visited Letchworth. It was eight days after our investigation had begun. Governor Rockefeller, amidst a growing public outcry over the conditions at Willowbrook, made an announcement. He was restoring the $20 million he had stricken from the budget of the Department of Mental Hygiene. Willowbrook, it was said, would be able to rehire 300 of the 900 employees it had lost since November 1970. Letchworth Village would be able to rehire about 200. But the additional employees, while perhaps slowing the downward course of these two institutions, would not be able to change the basic nature of the two places, mere depositories for the retarded. You think what we showed on television in the past week is an accurate reflection of the problem of the situation? I think it focused and made vivid the problems at Willowbrook. Do you think it was an honest portrayal? I think it was an honest portrayal of the problems at their worst. Uh, I. It may not tell the whole story of, of Willowbrook, and it certainly doesn't tell the whole story of the retarded, but it does describe unmistakably the kind of problems that we've seen, and now, thanks to the, uh, to, to, to the coverage, many people have seen. If the public eye leaves Willowbrook and all of the other places, and we once again uh, find ourselves, we and the directly involved parents, trying to go it alone, but I think we struggle to maintain our few gains, and we struggle slowly to get ahead. And perhaps if you were to come back a year from now and look again, you might see that we've made headway. I expect you would, but you won't see it all solved in two weeks. I wish you would go back in two weeks, and in two weeks, and in two weeks, uh, because I think 
they that the a, a window on these conditions and maybe even allowing to begin to see what not only what is but what it could be and even what it is already in some places so to reinforce the sense of hopefulness and to reestablish in people's minds that we're talking about human beings with potential i would hope that you would see continued change and if you didn't see it that you'd say so two weeks after that interview i took dr miller up on his invitation to revisit willowbrook i found no meaningful change in the quality of life for the 5230 people who live here the attendants are trying their best but the staff is just too small to do anything more than just try and keep the place clean when there's only one person to take care of 30 or 40 nothing good can possibly happen no rehabilitation no training nothing the attendants are as much the victim of the conditions here as the patients are and this visit has ruined the prisons and the hospitals. The way we care for our mentally retarded is the last great disgrace. The story of Willowbrook and of Letchworth Village is a story of degradation. A real-life horror story of lack of attention, of filth, and of children living as animals live in uncivilized and human existence. But our intention is not just to horrify, but also to demonstrate that it doesn't have to be that way. This is Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. It houses the Regional Center for the Mentally Retarded. The director of the program is Dr. Richard Koch. Last month, at the invitation of several parents' groups, he toured the Willowbrook facility. The conditions that I saw at Willowbrook uh, are somewhat like this. When you enter the building I entered, the smell is, is so overwhelming, it's almost nauseating. I frankly don't understand how they have people who will work there, to be honest with you. And I think that's the first thing that hits you. Secondly, uh, you find uh, many patients in the same room, all milling about uh, with nothing to do. Now, I may have seen an unusual situation, but I don't believe so because I saw three different buildings. And uh, in those buildings, I did not see any kind of program. I saw men sitting around masturbating. I saw boys and girls lying on the floor, uh, some of them naked. Uh, in other words, it, it just was uh, without program, and I think that is the crucial thing. It's just simply too big. The important thing, though, about the Willowbrook situation, as I see it, is that the system is feeding on itself. In other words, there isn't any alternative for parents uh, that need help. The state is only reaching out its hand primarily with residential care in mind. And the, what parents want, by and large, are a rich variety of programs, primarily in the community. And the reason we've been able to get an expansion of our program in California, even with Mr. Reagan as governor, uh, is because this program is showing that it has cut the rate of institutionalized retarded persons in California to practically almost in half in just five years. Public pressure can apparently force change in California as well as it does here in New York. They had a system that resembled ours until 1965. That was when a prominent European expert on retardation said something that was widely publicized. After touring the California facilities, he said, my God, you don't care for your mentally retarded children as well as we in Europe care for our cattle. The remark eventually caused them to dramatically restructure their approach. The heart and soul of the California system is now no longer the large state institution. It's the regional center. Children's Hospital is one of the 13 centers in the state. Various programs are administered in neighborhoods all over Los Angeles County and the San Fernando Valley from here. Sub offices provide whatever services a family with a retarded child needs, be it a daycare center, a sheltered workshop, or medical care. The idea is to shift the care and training of the retarded to their own community. In other words, to help the parents keep their children at home. Education for the retarded in California is as much a right as education for normal children. And they're working toward the development of a public school program for every child, no matter the degree of retardation. This is a developmental center for handicapped minors. All these children are severely or profoundly retarded. This is an entirely a state-supported uh, program and provides tremendous relief to the parent in terms of daycare. Now, these children would be parallel to the children at Willowbrook, for instance. Oh, yes. All of these children would be in an institution for the retarded if we didn't have this kind of program for them. The fact is, in years past, I used to recommend institutional care myself for similar children. 
Now, New York is doing some of this, but here again, uh, we've realized that the community programs uh, should have top priority in terms of state dollars rather than last priority. And I think your priorities are mixed up in New York in terms of serving the retarded. Your top investment is in institutions. Our top investment is in the Department of Education and, and providing a program for the child while he's at home in terms of daycare. For example, these kids can go to school at age three years. So they start at very young, and that helps a great deal for parents. And when parents are actively uh, encouraged to keep their child at home, they do so because they know they can have the help of regional centers or public schools or the health department in terms of services, etc. For the mild to moderately retarded over school age, the regional center assists in the finding of employment in one of the many sheltered workshops in the area. In the workshop, you are seeing uh, less severely retarded persons, and the tremendous importance of this is that it gives the retarded person something to do during the daytime that gives them dignity, and they earn a little money with it, and they do something useful. They become a contributor to society instead of a drag on society. If you look around and see and just visualize all these people sitting home vegetating, here they are in the stream of life and doing their own thing. They're earning their own way. Dr. Cope told me time and again that the importance of prevention could not be overemphasized. Families with histories of genetic retardation are counseled not to have more children. And if there's a great probability that a pregnant woman is carrying a retarded child, she's tested. And if the fetus is found brain damaged, the center recommends a therapeutic abortion. The center also runs an extensive program of community education and prenatal care, the lack of which is a prime cause of retardation. There you are. There you are. Now, actually, uh, this child has Down syndrome, and uh, she's just as retarded as most of your patients at Willowbrook. And we're helping this family to keep her at home, and the mother is doing a beautiful job on her. Hey. And uh, the important thing is we're also providing genetic counseling to the family. This is an inherited form of Down syndrome. And we have uh, advised the mother that this is true and, frankly, have advised them not to have any more of their own children. How is this child being better serviced by being home rather than being in an institution like Willowbrook? Well, for example, she has access to one of the finest pediatric facilities in the world right here at Children's Hospital. If she were in a state hospital, she wouldn't have access to this kind of a facility. How about parental care? Is that making a difference in this child? Parental care makes a difference in every child, even the very retarded person. If you could get that across to people, that retarded people are more normal than they are abnormal. They have feelings, love, hate etc., just like normal people. The only thing is, is they simply don't think as fast as a normal person. How old is she? She's two years old. Two years old? Right. What would be happening to her if she were in a place like Willowbrook? Uh, well, frankly, probably nothing. But Dr. Koch admits that for some retarded, perhaps one and a half to three percent, 24-hour residential care will always be necessary. And some California institutions, Fairview State and Orange County, for example, could be described in the most unflattering terms as smaller, cleaner Willowbrook. But while Willowbrook has a large waiting list, the California institutions are being rapidly emptied. In five years, their total population is down from more than 14,000 to less than 10,000, and that number continues to go down. But even in the area of 24-hour residential care, they're moving to improve the quality of life. This is the Spastic Children's Foundation, a private organization that provides total care. It costs $14 a day for a child to live here. It costs the state of New York $21 a day to house a child in Willowbrook. And if the California parent can't afford the bill, the state contributes based on the family's ability to pay. This is an individualized program. Each child has a prescription for therapy, for academic training, for social adjustment, for feeding training, toilet training, every facet of his life that he needs help with. We sit down as a staff and we talk about his total needs, not just today, but where is he going to be in the future and how does his family relate to him because all of these things are a part of the whole with this child. See, we see these people as very important human beings. It's a five-day resident program, so the child actually goes home for two Right, days. because we want the family to remain the controlling factor in this child's life presently. We started this series as kind of an expose on conditions at Willowbrook and one of the things that really struck me as, as barbaric is the well, the toilet facilities, they're mm -hmm. so awful, mm -hmm. so filthy. Yeah. Is this much more money to keep it this way? It isn't one cent more. It doesn't cost any more to be clean. It doesn't cost any more to be cheerful and bright and colorful. It's a matter of interest in providing, and seeing these children as
most important people is how much status you give to them. And uh, sometimes because they can't respond and say what they like and dislike, it's very easy for people to just sit back and say, well, this is good enough. But it isn't good enough. They deserve everything that you and I want out of life. But they can't get it for themselves. Here, the toothbrushes have the children's names on them. In Willowbrook, there were no toothbrushes. Hi, Richard. How you doing? Uh, fine. I see you're copying a Van Gogh there. You better watch it. You get in trouble. <laughs> yes. How long did you live in the state school before you came here? About 10 years. You like it better here? Yes. The thing that impressed me most on the California trip was an apartment where retarded people live in semi-independence. Irene, how do you like it living here? I love it. How come? I can do my own thing. I think the main difference between the approach of New York and that of California to the problem of caring for the mentally retarded is that they treat the retarded as people. We treat them as something less. We haven't given the people who run the New York program equal time to give their side of the story. Well, as Edward R. Murrow once said, on some stories there is no other side. Perhaps the governor can defend and explain away the budget cuts for the Department of Mental Hygiene, and perhaps Dr. Miller can explain and defend the filthy dehumanizing conditions we found in this and other buildings, but they won't do it on this program. What we found and documented here is a disgrace to all of us. This place isn't a school, it's a dark corner where we throw children who aren't pretty to look at. It's the big town's leper colony. How long have you been at Willowbrook? 18 years. How long were you given physical therapy in school? Five years. Are you still going to school? No. Why? I'm over, over age. You're too old? Yes. Would you like to go back to school? Yes, I do. What would you want to learn if you went back to school? I would not want to read anymore. Learn how to read? Yes. Yeah. How, how is, how is it living on the ward that you live? Disgrace. It's a disgrace? Yes. Why? The, con the conditions are getting worse every time they cut the budget more and more. But even Bernard, with his tragically eloquent plea for help, doesn't really understand that what Willowbrook needs isn't more money. More money would certainly help. At least the kids would have clothes and they'd be cleaner than they are now, but they'd still basically be human vegetables in a detention camp. What we need is a new approach. We have to change the way we care for our mentally retarded. We ask for change. We demand change. What you've seen here just doesn't have to be this way. Although 50 years had passed since the airing of the original ABC television exposé, the horrors of Willowbrook State School remain as vivid as a nightmare as, as ever. When we describe certain individuals as probably not needing an uh, introduction, uh, certainly pertains to Geraldo Rivera. Uh, Geraldo, is, Geraldo is an investigative journalist, talk show host, political commentator, and television personality. Particularly relevant to tonight, his expose, Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace, would go on to win a Peabody Award in 1972. I'm pleased now to invite Geraldo Rivera to share some of his initial thoughts and reflections on the expose 50 years later. Welcome, Geraldo Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's very, very difficult to, to watch that. It's uh, the... The fascinating thing is how it's a half a century ago, and it feels so current. It feels so immediate. And the, the dangers of neglect are so vivid 
I'm sorry, in, in that, in that video, it's, it's the people who are developmentally disabled, and I apologize for the language, the R word, Bernard gets so mad at me. And I, it, and I, I put it in the past, but that's 50 years ago. But the, the humanity is the same. The solution is the same. What developmentally disabled people need is the same thing able-bodied people need. It's, they need to have their human potential realized. They have to be able to be in a situation where they can be as much as, 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 much as they can possibly be. I, I think the, the, the promotion of the idea of the community-based residence, that was perhaps the most important development of, of that investigative saga. It's something I'm still deeply involved in now with Life's Work and the other charities that we support. Because the, the best thing for any child is one-to-one -one attention. Someone should know what the child likes to eat, what the child likes to wear. Someone should be, however handicapped, there is, there is not only for the humanity of the, of the recipient of the care, but also for the giver of the care, there is an exhilaration that comes from allowing a handicapped person, giving them the tools they need. You know, now you see the, with the Paralympics and uh, you know, with all of now, with, with all of the, the community-based charities, coast to coast now, really spreading throughout the Western world, you see the same points. You want the parents to be involved in a situation where they don't feel helpless, where they don't feel alone, where they, they don't feel ostracized because their child is, has special needs. You want the, them to be in a place where the parents of Willowbrook have all aged out, generally speaking. I mean, there's some like me hanging on into their 70s, but what happens to the, the children that are now adults themselves? Young adults, then middle-aged adults, and then they're going to be seniors also because now they, they live, and I, I don't mean to bandy these pronouns, but now the handicapped live the same life expectancy if given the conditions as the able body. The institution was developed for one reason. It was the most efficient way in terms of taxpayer dollars to take care of this population. So you herded them all into the institution, you closed the door, deprived even the parents of access. The outside world denied access. Bobby Kennedy only got in because he was senator from New York State in 1965. So the horror was allowed to fester and metastasize and become that awful, awful place. And those words, this is what it looked like. This is what it sounded like. But how can I tell you about the way it smelled? I swear to God, that is my... my nightmare 50 years later. So now we have Medicaid and Medicare, we have systems and the, there's constant beefs with, with the government of, of you know, underfunding and all the rest. But this is a sea change what has happened. I see Bernard there and he can speak for himself. But his story in many ways is the most eloquent testimony. Bernard wasn't disabled mentally. He had cerebral palsy. Three years old, he was thrown into this institution. For 18 years, 
he, he languished there, ignored, fighting to get any kind of education, any kind of personal attention. And then he met uh, Dr. Mike Wilkins, a saint, and, and Bill Bronston and the others, and understood when he turned 21 his rights. And then, you know, finally liberating himself from the institution and becoming the wonderful, engaging man he is today, having a wonderful career, you know, uh, helping reform as patient advocate uh, for the state, the things that were so awful. And, I, and Bernard, you know, when he's become such a, such a prominent advocate. And I, I just, you know, I love him, he's my brother. And as I said, he can speak for himself, but Bernard is what we want for everyone that was formally institutionalized, to get freedom, to be somebody to be somebody, not just one of those creatures that you step over and you feed slop to. I mean, isn't that horrible when you think about it? That, that porridge that they made, mushing up bread and milk and shoving it down the mouths. And then as the, as the food went down their, their throats, getting into their lungs and causing pneumonia and killing them, 25 years old, maybe if they're lucky, if they had life expectancy. Of course, we have to be vigilant. Of course, we have to constantly fight for a fair share. Of course, we have to keep the parents involved. And, uh, you know, life's work in this our, our charity, we have a, a respite center for adults uh, of, of, the, of, of the disabled because it has to be, the whole family has to be engaged. You wanna keep people engaged. You wanna keep the parents engaged. You want the child to have a relationship as another saint, Dr. Cook said in, in their children's lives. I'm very proud of what we did 50 years ago. The, you know, we've raised funds, you know, John Lennon did a concert and we used to do the boxing matches and now we do the golf tournament you know, it, we, it, it, it's a it's a grind. It is you have to constantly think of new ways to to fund the activity. You have to you have to buy into the evolution. We never the, the reason I'm so proud of that. I haven't seen that completed film in decades, decades. I think that's why it's such it, it's such a visceral reaction in me. But I'm proud that social work schools and all the rest play it for the young young professionals coming into you know uh, that that the field of of caring for the disabled because it reminds this was New York City this wasn't you know Kazakhstan this was on Staten Island in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and it was allowed to happen you know it's funny. I know it's going to be over Bernard. This is, this is the key to building number six. This is the key that Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Brunson got me. Governor Carey gave it to me in the, I, I forget the year when they finally closed it, 80 something, 86 maybe. And he gave me the key. This is like, I'm more proud of this than Emmys or Peabody's or anything. This is, this says it all. That's, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And, and um, I, I'm going to get that wonderful opportunity to uh, also formally introduce Bernard as, as well, too. Uh, you know, as we move to the panel discussion portion of, of this event, um, I just want to remind everyone to please submit any questions that you may have in the, in the Q&A tab. I see many coming in uh, for, the, for the latter portion uh, of the Q&A as well, too. And again, uh, to make this uh, event universally accessible, there will continue to be live captioning by an actual human transcriptionist tonight and can be accessed via the CC button on the toolbar. So as Geraldo already had mentioned, uh, Rivera had just been, uh, Geraldo Rivera has already mentioned, we're honored to have another very special guest joining us tonight, and that's Bernard Caravello, who may look familiar to you as he's featured in the expose. Um, Bernard is a former resident of the Willowbrook State School, a disability activist and founder of the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State. 
In November 2020, Bernard was the recipient of an honorary doctorate of Hume Lane Letters from the College of Staten Island, City University of New York, uh, in 2022 in recognition of his distinguished career in disability advocacy, he was inducted into the New York State Independent Living Council Hall of Fame. We're also joined by co-moderator today, uh, Eric Goldberg, uh, and I see him there, uh, who's gonna also ask questions of our guest. Eric is a self-advocate, a GED graduate from CSI's Continuing Studies and the great Melissa Riggio Higher Education Program, which I had the distinct honor of overseeing when I was at CSI. Eric is also co-chair of the Staten Island Developmental Disabilities Council, Willowbrook Legacy Committee, and member of the council's executive board. So uh, I have a question that relates to Bernard and, and I, I'm gonna ask Bernard to respond as well too to you, Geraldo, if it's cool. Can I start asking you a question that relates to Bernard? You're form, you formed a lifelong connection to each other. Um, can you talk, uh, and you covered it a little bit already, uh, can you talk about how your relationship with Bernard began and developed and perhaps how your relationship has affected your views of people with disabilities and, and advancing inclusion? And again, I know you covered some already, but we'd love to get into your relationship just a little more. Well, the most important thing to remember is that my mustache is a lot nicer than Bernard's. I, know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and we, we, the older we get, the more we look alike, you know, is, uh, He's my, he's my brother as much as my brother Craig is in the room. Bernard is part of the family, you know, and I, I think he feels the same. We've been, uh, you know, uh, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, the relationship has, has, has been one of love, you know, uh, I'm listening to his wisdom based on his experience and his, his, his deep intellect. You know, it's, we love hanging out. We talk about old times and we talk about new times. He has a, he's, he's very political. When I liked Donald Trump, he, he really was really very upset with that, but he forgave me when I, uh, when I saw the light. I don't want to get political about it, but uh, uh, you know, he's, he is, I think, in my view, the most effective advocate for the, the, the disabled, the disabled community, uh, you, you know, because when you, when you take the time to listen, you hear the wisdom of life experience. And I wish that he could speak at every school of social work in this country. Uh, you know, he's a very, very special person in our life. Our, my kids were raised uh, you know, with him, around him, uh, and as a result, you know, I never had any experience with the develop, with develop uh, disabilities before. Nobody in my family was disabled. That's why the, uh, one of the reasons that was such a shock to me when I went into Willowbrook. I, you know, I, I of course had seen Down syndrome uh, kids uh, once in a while, but not, not even a lot of that, and, and because families had a whole different attitude. And look at the Kennedys, how they closeted uh, Rosemary. You know, it's uh, now we, we we feel differently about it. We're you know, parents are parents are parents. You know, it's a uh, it's a very different world, and I I credit him with really being an an, instru an instrument of social change and a historic figure. Thank, thank you, Haral and Bernard. I don't think you could have. I think this is the best introduction anyone has ever given in the history of interviews. Bernard, please, if you could share with us a, a little bit about your relationship with Geraldo uh, and what that relationship has been to you as well, too. We've been for 50 years. Would we agree to this week? I'm over dry. He's over long. Well, we have, we have a great relationship. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bernard, for sharing. I, I have uh, Eric now as my co-host. Eric, I, I think you have a first question for Geraldo. If you could uh, please fire away. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yes. Sorry, sorry about the technical issue before. So, Geraldo, glad to have you. Um, and, you know, sure. thank you for all you've done. As someone with a disability myself, I know my life has been better than it could have been because of your efforts at Willowbrook. Has the expose impacted your life? Well, Eric, it changed my life in many ways, some superficial and others deep and meaningful, profound. It's superficial way it propelled me at a very young age. I was 27, 28 years old. Uh, I was a year in the business when it, when uh, Willowbrook happened. It propelled me uh, to a kind of a celebrity uh, that uh, was affected my life. You know, I, I went from making a, you know, a couple hundred dollars a week to being a you know someone with a with a car and I could buy my own apartment and so forth. Spiritually. In, in more meaningful terms, it changed my, it changed everything in my life. It changed how I see life itself. It was something that was, I, I had no children myself. I, I became very parental in a way. I mean, now we're immediately starting in 1972, when I see a family with uh, a, with the disability, whether an adult or a, a child, I feel like I am related to them. It's a, it's an unusual, you know, I, I, reporters can get emotionally involved in stories, but I, I, this story became my world. It became my life. It changed everything. And, and I, I mean that when I say that, when I see a family with disabilities, it's like, and they feel the same vibe. I get that vibe and, and wherever I go. When I, I if there's, if there's a, a, a teenager with Downs or whatever it is, you know, we look at each other in the eye and I know you, you know me. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so it's been everything to me, Eric. It's, uh, you know, I, I hope that that's on my, tombstone or my epitaph rather than I opened Al Capone's vault and I got my nose broken in a brawl with the skinheads. You know, I want, I want Willowbrook, which is the capstone of my career and which is the center of my life, aside from my own children, of course. Uh, you know, it is, it is everything to me. It changed everything. Nothing was the same the day after that story, Eric. Thank you. Um, and it will be. And you're, Trust, uh, you're such a good supporter, and and thank you again. Um, you. I've got I've got another question. It from me. It is hard to watch the images in this series, even for me. I I have to be honest, like you, Geraldo. I was tearing up through most of it myself. What were the most difficult images for you to see and experience? <sighs> oh, if, if I if I had to reduce it to one image. It was the contrast between Willowbrook, the physical plant, you know, like where the College of Staten Island is now, that <laughs> relatively lovely facility, the grounds, the big buildings, imposing, impressive buildings. And once inside, the image of the child with his or her pants down around their knees under the sink in, in the bathroom, making that sound and nobody there. Oh. You know, it's, it's, old men get emotional. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about it. No, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. Like I said, me, myself, having a disability and having a brother who has uh, a disability and signs himself and can't really talk, it, it, got, it, it gets to me too. And I try to help him as much as possible. So to the next question, uh, you know the Willowbrook Mile is slated to open in September. We are hoping you will continue to support your efforts as, uh, actually, this is not a question, I'm sorry. 
I'm <laughs> doing no right now. Sorry. You know the uh, you you do uh, you, I don't know. You know the Willowbrook Mile is slated to open in September. We are hoping you will continue to support our efforts to remember the past and protect the future. Finally, uh, protect the future and 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 come. Please come because you're a big app. You're a big asset to us. Thank you as always. And 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 you're an inspiration to me. I have a brother who's, uh, you know, got a disability. Uh, you know, uh, a disability himself. He's MR. And 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 you've been such an inspiration of me helping him as well. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. And yes, Bernard and I will be there, God willing. Okay. Yes. And, and, and Eric, I think you have uh, uh, one more question for uh, Bernard, I think. Yes, I do, actually. Um, okay, so uh, let me just find it here. Okay, so a question for you, Bernard. And Bernard, you've been my biggest advocate as well. I know I, I've reached out to you a couple of times and you've always been so, so helpful and always guided me. I first want to thank you for all you have done, as I said, as being an advocate. How can we today ensure that Willowbrook doesn't happen again? Is telling the story enough? We, we have to keep in mind people what happened in the past and make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. The next, we got to educate the next generation so that it can take over and make sure people get better services than they get today. Very well said, very well said. And like I, like I, uh, Ill, uh, like I said earlier, you've been a guiding light to me as well, you know. Uh, so thank you, Bernard. And then um, it's, up, it's up to you, to you all to make sure that you all get what you want. And not, you. and not to take and again that they give you because they feel it's better for you. You all need to speak up and advocate for you and for other people around me. Yes, and I, and I, and I, just a little aside, I've been doing that. That's why I'm on the Willowbrook Legacy Committee, a co-chair on the SIDDC, and, you know, to advocate for others who can't advocate for themselves, you know, to continue the legacy that you, Geraldo, has put forward and you, Bernard, have put forward. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gerardo, uh, Bernard, and Eric uh, for, for that special session. Um, uh, Eric and I have many more questions for you, but I know the audience has questions for, for you as well. Uh, so I think we're gonna move now to the audience question and our uh, question and answer segment. Uh, again, please push your questions in the Q&A section and we'll try to get to as many uh, of you as possible, as your questions as possible. I'm so pleased now to introduce Dr. Catherine Lavender. Uh, CSI History Professor, Director of the Bertha Harris Women's Center, Community Advocate, and Co-Chair of CSI's Willowbrook Legacy Committee. Uh, Catherine has been monitoring the questions submitted uh, for, for, for us, and so Catherine, if you could take it away, that'd be wonderful. I'll try. There are so many questions coming in, and a lot of the questions are people who want to thank you personally, both Bernard and Geraldo, for the impact that you've had. Many of them, and I'm, I'm going to make sure that you see these personally. Many oh. of them talk about the, the impact directly on their family, family members who would have ended up in a place like Willowbrook if your activism had not led to its closure. So I think it's really important for you to feel that love. There's so much love for you in the community and so many thankful people. You've had a really important impact on many people's lives. There also are a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to sum them together a little bit so we can get to several of them. One of the questions that comes up a lot is from people who might themselves want to be journalists. We have a number of documentary film students that are attending and people who are working on becoming journalists. And they'd like to know about how you were able to build trust with the people that you reported on 
I mean, the relationship you built with Bernard is really an important part of your journalism. So could you speak a bit about that, about how your method developed to make that possible? I was an activist lawyer, a young lawyer for a group called the Young Lords, actually, a Puerto Rican activist group. And they had activist doctors who helped service the Puerto Rican community in East Harlem. And one of those doctors serendipitously, uh, well, well, two of them, B Bill Bronston and, and Mike Wilkins were both doctors. Their initial uh, job was at the, as I recall, the, uh, the public, I forget the name of it, the, uh, the, it was a, a federally funded, a federal hospital where they had on Staten Island uh, and they, the, uh, I met the doctors who were advocating for the Native American nurses. Uh, for some reason, the, this public health service hospital had many Native American women working as nurses and they were being paid less than the, uh, than the, uh, you know, the rest of the uh, population, the uh, nurses. So the, I met Dr. Wilkins in that capacity uh, we did that story, uh, and he trusted me. And then when the time came uh, for him to confront the Willowbrook management, so to speak, he reached out, reached out to me. We had continued the relationship, talking about 1971, and well, basically it was all of 1971, 1970, 1971. Uh, I think the most important thing a young reporter can do is to is to foster trust with the source of the story. You've got to, you got to be true to your word. You've got to, you know, you've got to honor your confidences. You've got to do your homework. I mean, I think one of the most powerful things about the Willowbrook documentary, looking back on it, is the fact that we weren't just complaining about what happened at Willowbrook. We were offering up an alternative for the same or less money tax-wise, an, an alternative, a community-based alternative to the big institutions. You can't mass produce care the way you mass produce a Ford or a Chevy. You know, you've got, it's, it's the humanity of the, of, of the client has to always be center, center most. Engaging their family, recognizing that, you know, government, is basically one big mass of inertia. To get it to do anything is very difficult. Uh, you, you've got to have, I, I think the best thing is to be the kind of person who not only complains, exposes, but also offers a solution to the problem that you're complaining about. And you don't see, even now, you don't see nearly enough of that. You see a lot of people with their podcasts and their, you know, is the, there's more media than ever. I mean, you'd never, you could never these days, it seems to me, have a place like Willowbrook with everybody with a iPhone or whatever it is, the, the staffers would, uh, would rat out the management. I mean, you'd never, you'd, but, but it, it's not just, journalism is not just about quantity. It's about responsibility. What's this about? Who's the, what's the problem? And what are you gonna do about the problem? I think that the public needs some guidance. They need, you know, without sounding pretentious, they need education. They need to be informed. No one could be engaged emotionally in a problem unless you tell them what it is and what, what's going on. It's a what's going on. That story, when that story hit, that was like, lightning bolts hit New York City and to move the you know this historically cynical small town of you know what is it 15 million people in the metropolitan area I mean it shows you well you all saw it you've seen probably seen it before the power of those images nobody would justify or explain away those images they were intolerable and for a young journalist or young would-be journalist, you've got a computer, you've got, you know, if you have an idea, 
talk to people, research it thoroughly, and, and maybe reach out to somebody in a, in a media outlet near you. Or, you know, I'm not, I'm not into how you get the job, but the one thing you could do is go to social work school. And that's one way, if that's your interest, education, early education, uh, uh, you know, the, deal with disability. If, if disability, if, if solving or alleviating the problems with disabilities is your thing, you've got to immerse yourself. You've got to understand what you're talking about. You've got to talk to, you, you know, Bernard has been my, my eyes, so to speak. He's, he's the most effective, this whole concept, let me just back up, this whole concept of client advocacy and client responsibility, he helped invent that when he went to work for New York State. He was the one who, you know, he, even something like, uh, like language, and you saw some of the horrible language in that old documentary. Bernard is the one that told me about the R word. He said, I can't say that anymore. Would I say the N word? No. The R word is like, don't, don't say it anymore. Why? And then he explained about the uh, dignity and self-worth and uh, self-image and self-esteem and, and respect. You know, so that maybe that's just a little thing, but I think it's not a little thing. I think it's a big thing. Uh, you know, just think about all those movies where the R word was used and the, and, the, and the person being referred to with that expression was the loser. You know, that's why he told me to drop it. I said, okay, I get it. Now I get it. That was like social change. He changed my mind. I helped to change a lot of other people's minds through my, my, my media outlet. But how you get a job in media, that's, you got to, you got to be scrappy. You know, you got to take your shot, start small, have your own. My, my daughter, 16 years old, at her school started an online magazine. My 16 year old. You know, that, do that, do that. Someone's going to see it. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could plug into media or social work, but you've got to be your own advocate also because nothing's going to come. Nothing's going to come and say, oh, here it is. Because not everybody, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, is born with a silver spoon or whatever. Thank you. And, and then, I mean, I think that leads into another question that's come up over and over again. And it's really, I mean, I think you've answered how this has affected you. But I think the other question that comes up, people want to know how Bernard overcame that start in life to become such an amazingly effective advocate, not just for yourself, I mean, for yourself, of course, but for many people and to really change a system that was not set up to welcome you. And so people would like to hear about what it was that was the spark for you, and especially people who today are trying to become self-advocates and advocates themselves. Do you have some advice? What's the lesson you can teach them? Well, well my education means that's how I got all my education about People with all kinds of disabilities. And, and I, I hope we never go through this ever again. With the now humanity and that institu institution. And I mean, for the people who were there. And the people who were there, they were just of a victim as we were because they were working in horrible conditions. When you have two staff taking, uh, taking care of 80 people that needed to be fed, Dress, shower, 
everything. And that's why they had to feed people no more than 20 minutes to feed one person. When you and I take about an hour to eat it. And that's why. That's why the condition was so bad. Because there was not enough staff that take care of people in the, in the way they should have been taken care of. Yes. And we, we still have a lot of work to do. This has been going for years and years. It's never going to stop because things change every year. But for the good, now it's up to the next generation to take over and make sure that this does not happen again. And they must include people with developmental disability because you have a whole lot of people. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, when I grew, grew up in Mobile, there was more than me who did not belong in the institution. Yes. Some of them were put there by the court. And that was kind of a kick in the ass to the people who were in the institution. Meaning, by putting people that have gotten trouble with the law and put it in Louisville by the court. They would say, say, we all were a danger to society. And that's why it was a kick in the ass to us. Yes, absolutely. And what you hear people saying is that part of the struggle even today is overcoming people's assumptions about what Willowbrook was and was not. Right. I mean, it's not just that there was a very bad story that was hidden, but there were also stories being made up outside of the institution to tell the story, which were completely inaccurate. For instance, that the people were there because they were dangerous rather than because there was this desire to treat them in the early days and then a failure to live up to that. So that's a very important point. If you look on the outside of all of us, Housing built around war book. The people did not know that, that, that we had people there. They did not know that the people existed in the institution. That's the sale part. Yeah. They never got outside. Yeah. They never got outside. When you did your story, they were shocked that that was going on in the institute. I there was a, a staff, I'm not going to give you her name, every morning when she came to work, her, her first Project was is to beat the hell out of me. Oh no. Constantly. Day after day. I was in a straight jacket. They sedated me. They did everything. But I survived it. But I would never, never recommend anybody go back of it. 
that's a horrible education to have to, <laughs> to have that be one's education. But you know what? I look at it as a great education because I, I get to help people and I get to know all kinds of people. Yes. Well, the other question that comes up over and over again is, do you feel that there's a danger of a return to a Willowbrook with I budget do. cuts? I think that's a common fear. I, you want to say something about that? I do. When, when Cobra came out and the president of Staten Island, Dr. Fritz told me that they wanted to reopen Willowbrook and you use it as a hospital. And he said, no way. It's true. A couple One, of, oh, go ahead, Geraldo. I just, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when during the mayoral race, Eric Adams, who's a good man, and I like him, the mayor, uh, when he was a candidate, I knew him when he was a cop, and I, you know, I, I think he's going to be a great mayor. But he was asked about the the homeless, the visible homeless on the streets. And he said the problem is that it was an overreaction to Willowbrook, an overreaction to that people were so shocked by Willowbrook, the mayor was saying, they emptied it out. And that's the homeless people. He totally got it wrong, confusing. People I think Ill he with, got, yeah, he got confused between people with developmental disability and people with mental illness. Exactly. And that's but why if he didn't know. How, if he doesn't know, that's a problem. And I think that, that the young people now have to guard against that. There's a difference between yeah. someone with Down syndrome and someone who's schizophrenic, mm -hmm. who is someone with a you know another a kind of intellectual disability and someone who has mental illness. I, you know, the problem is a year or two or three after Willowbrook, they closed Creedmoor and the other facilities for the mentally ill without providing the safety net that advocates were providing for the developmental disabilities. The, the people of the kids of Willowbrook, the the the, the children of Willowbrook, so to speak, they had many more services than the the mentally ill. They closed Creed more, but they never followed through. They gave them drugs or whatever yeah. the the, mo the method, uh, what the moment was. But it, but for for Mayor Adams to not know the difference shows you how we have to constantly be on guard against a false impression, and and you know. I remember we were opening the first of the life work homes in in uh, uh, in Queens, in Little Neck, Queens, uh, and the neighbors were objecting. We don't want those people here. They're going to bring down the property values and so forth. And then we convinced them that, you know, on the contrary, these are great neighbors, and they just you know just give them a chance to be human, uh, to have humanity. I mean, it was a lot different than a homeless shelter. You know, I I I want. The homeless, obviously, to be cared for. I want facilities for the mentally ill. I think that there has to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, there have to be places where mentally ill people can go if they're having a, a, whatever the illness is or the, uh, you know, the the recurrence of the of the of the whatever it is that they have. I want them obviously to be served, <clears throat> but they are not the population from Willowbrook, and I think people should not confuse the two. You want humanity for everybody, but what's good for the goose is not necessarily good for the gander in this particular case. Back in the, back to the, back to the ages in the state of Alabama, they burned a group home down to the cloud, killed everybody in the house. That's how bad it was. Because of their un not understanding. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So another question that's come in is, 
-hmm. How do we make sure that we get that story out there? How can we uh, work with journalists to get that story out there? My, my brother just reminded me of what the solution was. When Vicki Schnepps, the director or the, the, the founder of Life's Work, she has a Wilbur parent. What she did, she re, you know, she's a very renowned publisher now, a very important person in the media, Vicki Schnepp. What she did was she reached out to Eric Adams and said, come to the Geraldo home. We're going to show you what, where you are wrong and why this population makes great neighbors. And this is a d different problem than the one you as a, you know, as a new mayor uh, will be, would be dealing with in terms of the homelessness and all the rest. It was his seeing and I think that's a good solution to a lot of the misunderstanding is let the, let the community have access. Not like Willowbrook where you have lock and key. And you want people to, to come and see and, and feel optimistic. And you look at this wonderful place and uh, Sally goes to work at the workshop or, uh, you know, Mike does, uh, uh, you know, look how nice it is. He's getting uh, language or he's more ambulatory or, there's some progress or there's some evolution, you know, education comes from exposure to knowledge. And I think that Mayor Adams now understands where he was wrong and now he's, you know, an advocate now. So I'm, I'm also hearing from people involved in the long uh, telling of the story of Willowbrook that we have many lectures from Dr. Wilkins. We have interviews with Bernard on the on uh, Willowbrook Revisited, this program that Diane Bolioli created. And so there are resources so people can hear those stories, but we're trying to make sure that they reach a broader audience. And what a wonderful event tonight to have so many people coming from all over the world. I'm hearing in the in the questions that many people are students at different universities studying to become teachers, inclusive teachers. Many people are, are you know, parents looking back on this, family members of other people who are residents. What's What to me is always very striking is the trauma that many of these families experience. You know, the, the sister or the brother of the, the child who was sent to Willowbrook who disappeared from their life and to watch the pain of the parents who've lost that child and the difficulty of maintaining that relationship. And it is really striking to me how important it is to value those and honor those familial ties, not to let them simply be erased as not, you know, those residents were not connected to anybody. They were just residents. They're family members, their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and, and cousins and children. And that's what I'm hearing from people that what you've done is allowed them, for many of them, this was the first opportunity that the family could discuss what they had experienced. Some people say that they watched it, they <laughs> snuck away to watch it because it was too traumatic for their parents to address, but they as siblings needed to hear the story. So what you've done is a tremendously important thing. You know, Bernard sharing his story is tremendously important, and that just comes through so clearly in the comments from the audience, and I want to make sure that those reach you. Because, you know, it's nice to be able to look back on those on a dark afternoon <laughs> and realize how important that work has been. So I just, I want to thank you so much on behalf of the many people who have been saying that in the, in the Q&A. As I said, I, I, I feel so deeply immersed. I am, I am you, I say to the families. And Bernard and I, we have a, we have a great, Relation. We love talking to people about what happened and where we are. And as I as I said, you, I point I point to him. You know, he's uh, he's the past and he's the future. And and he's no one's going to speak out for you unless you speak out for yourself in right. all aspects of life, whatever your 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 right. story is. And he's you building that future. Story. And, and if you can come up with a solution to a problem, a great idea, look at uh, Elon Musk and Tesla. He just donated, what, $6 billion? I mean, that's what I want you to do. Go out there and invent something and donate $6 billion uh, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's it, I, I, I think, I know there's problems still. 
I mean, the community-based residences still have a resistance here or there. They always perennial funding problems, always staffing problems. There's always something going on. And yet, this is one of those stories where it's not like global warming, the world is ending, or uh, we're going to have war on Ukraine. It's one of those stories, one of those precious stories where you could say, we started there, and now we're here, and here's a lot better than there. It's been... It's been a, 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 quite a, an odyssey, bumpy road, but there's no doubt that here is much better than there. And the future with self-advocacy, with familial involvement, with the continued, uh, uh, you know, I cannot emphasize enough that silence is, I don't want to say death, it's not death, but silence is not going to work for anybody. You've got to speak out, know what you're talking about. But I just want to say one thing about the families and running into the families. You know, it's, it, it's been so long. It started with, on the, on the streets, you know, my, uh, you know, I saw Willowbrook and, you know, my uncle Johnny was there or uh, my aunt Sally was there. My cousin Billy was there, and then it became the next. Uh, you know, uh, my grandchild. Uh, or, you know, it's it, we've. I've seen the, the arc now. You know, we've lived long enough to see success stories, lament those who got chopped up by that awful system, uh, and to understand that the easy one of the easiest things to cut in your budget is the disabled if they are quiet. You could always say, ah, 30 million here, 50 million there, 100 million there, we can give it, buy another tank or whatever it is. Don't let that happen. You have a constitutional right, I say to these parents, a constitutional right to the same care, same facilities, same accessibility as any other group in society. The days of the dark, Warehousing, they're over. Nobody, nobody can make an argument that that way was better than this way. So I think that we can celebrate. Everybody's, you know, so intense and everybody wants to be somebody to do so. You can celebrate that this is better than it was. That this was, this was, and the media is widely reviled and for a lot of good reasons and the partisanship and all the rest of it. This is one that, something everybody could agree on. It's one of those rare stories. It was, it was horrible. And now it's a hell of a lot better. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Ken to come back as our host and and say some Thanks. closing remarks. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank the panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, but most of all, thank you, Gerardo Rivera and Bernard uh, Carabello for just being able to participate tonight. It was, it, I, any conclusion I can cannot do what has been discussed here justice, I have to say, but I'm gonna try. And I'm gonna go back to 2014, Geraldo, because uh, that's when you return to the College of Staten Island in the context of the College of Staten Island as a keynote speaker for the departmental exercise. You may remember this for the first graduating class of our Bachelor of Science in Social Work degree. And I have to do your concluding remarks of, will forever stay with me. Um, you said toward the graduates uh, you know, about world work, and I'm going to quote you, the haunting memories are something I will carry forever. But what I see now in seeing you now you will be the memory I have of this place. You have taken my nightmare and you have made it into something enormously positive. So on a grander scale, I believe this is what we're all trying to do together with a Willowbrook legacy. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and I'll now turn it back to Catherine to conclude our program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the audience for all of the really excellent questions. I wish I could have read every single one. I tried to summarize them. I hope that I was able to capture the interest that people had. 
And I want to thank the, in addition to the panelists that have been thanked, and of course to thank Ken Awama for coming home to us. This will always be your home, Ken. And uh, thank you so much for coming back to us. I want to thank the people who you don't see on screen who have been very important to making this happen, yeah. especially Craig Rivera, Geraldo Rivera's brother and producer, who is really a, a key figure in all of this, yeah, and the Willowbrook Legacy Committee. Many thank of you, Craig. Yes, thank you, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Been thank very you. active. And also for technical support, I'd like to thank uh, David Pizzuto, Ismail Hassan, and Alexander Dudek. We've had live broadcast captioning from Karash and Associates. And I also want to thank our community donors who have been making donations toward the Willowbrook Legacy Project, which makes it possible for us to hire outside uh, transcribers to make sure that these events are as accessible as we would like them to be and make sure that everyone in our community is able to participate. I just want to invite you to the next couple of events that are coming. The next one is an opportunity to hear from the parents, those parent activists, some amazing people who did push very hard and worked very closely with Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Bronson to close down Willowbrook and to demand that their children be given humane treatment. So that event will be on March 8th. Registration is open now on uh, Eventbrite and you can sign up. We would love to have a thousand people at that event as well. The next yeah. event of the big event of the year is our annual Willowbrook Memorial Lecture. I think this is the 39th in the series founded by Professor David Good, Professor Emeritus in our sociology department. And this year we'll be focusing on what happens to the residents of Willowbrook State School after the school closed. It's called Beyond Willowbrook. It'll be hosted by Ronnie Cohen, who was charged with overseeing the class. And it will include some really wonderful people who were involved in helping make that transition for former residents after the state school closed and for the Willowbrook class. And then I just want to share information. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing at the Willowbrook Legacy Project, you can visit our website. You can reach out to us directly at willowbrook at csi.cuny.edu. If you registered, and you would have for this on Eventbrite, you can also click on Follow, and you'll be notified of every event that we do after this, so you can keep hearing. And then finally, if you'd like to support our project, we do have a fundraising page at GiveGab, and you can find the link here. It's also linked, if you go to Eventbrite, it's linked in our biography of the Willowbrook Legacy Project. And we welcome any donations that help us support the programs that we're offering. I want to thank you all for being here. It was a very meaningful night. It was really wonderful to get to be with you and to have so many people so engaged in this. And Willowbrook, is this, this amazing film is not the end of the Willowbrook story. And I take great comfort from that, that the story continues and it gets better and it's still being written. So thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of the Willowbrook Legacy thank Project, you. good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. I want to see the people. Bernard, I'll see you. Bye. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't get the link.